So for a brief insight into my background, um, I started in IT infrastructure and operations. Because of that, ITIL will always hold a, a special place in my heart. Um, I got my first job in security on an identity team helping with automation, which led to building a dedicated cloud security team and the opportunity to implement most of the AWS native security tools at scale and operationalize them. And that leads me into why I'm here today. Let's assume that everyone here is working for a security focused organization that has a fully matured logging solution. Um, whether it's on-prem or hosted in the cloud, most monolithic logging solutions are focused on doing the job of collecting the data from a variety of sources. Event response, other than alerts, are typically not in scope of most of these solutions on their own. Before going out and buying a security uh, orchestration and automated response tool, or trying to make an existing one that was not built for the cloud work in the cloud, uh, let's take a look at EventBridge and see how that can fill the gap. The event, excuse me, the EventBridge service can provide an automated response in AWS, as well as act as a broker for events between the services and other tools. EventBridge provides an event bus for event management, basically. It can be used for application design, third-party partner integration, and relevant to today's subject, security and compliance. For anyone familiar with CloudWatch events, this is gonna look really familiar. In 2019, AWS combined the core functionality of CloudWatch events into EventBridge and then expanded them. These enhancements included third-party event sources and custom event buses, among others. Needless to say, the full feature set of EventBridge service far exceeds what I'm covering today. Today, I'm gonna to start by going over how EventBridge can assist in event management and response, and then talk about how it can be applied at scale. I'm gonna go over services with delegated administration and go over how they can be integrated into a similar design pattern, also using EventBridge. So let's briefly highlight a couple of concepts. Uh, an event bridge rule consists of a pattern that matches events and at least one target where that event message can be forwarded. The patterns and the events are represented as JSON objects and targets consist of services that enable the processing of the event by serving as a destination for that event message. These are gonna be the services that you can use for notification, automated remediation, <clears throat> excuse me, automated and automated remediation. We're gonna end up digging into SNS, SQS, and Lambda a little bit later. I'm gonna go over several designs. So if you have questions about any of them, make a note of the slide number and be sure to bring it up when you get a chance or when given a chance. I've got time allocated for questions. So please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll try not to jump past any of them. So let's start by talking about where the events are coming from. EventBridge, EventBridge has the option to match events based on the API calls found in CloudTrail from most services. So if you're looking for a specific API call with specific parameters, a pattern can be built to match on as much detail as is provided in the API call itself. Events that your team deems high priority enough to take action on may include identity calls like create user. Because this action will be captured in CloudTrail, we can build a pattern for the API calls from the identity service with that action explicitly identified. There are other, excuse me, there are also other services like Guard Duty, Macy, and Security Hub, which are going to produce findings through ML recommendations and predefined industry standards. In this diagram, we can see where Security Hub is detecting a new VPC that was configured without flow logs. The 2.9 here is the CIS foundation control number. I'm gonna use this as an example to show how EventBridge can also assist in automating security compliance and remediation. This is a pattern, uh, an event pattern in the EventBridge service. Taking Security Hub and CIS foundations as an example, we can use um, we can use these event patterns to actually provide a, an actual example. The CIS benchmarks are a great place to start 
but not all controls out of the box are going to be a fit for every organization. Using event pattern matching, we can target specific messages based on control number or the status, and even build responses from the ground up by responding based on specific data contained in the event. In this example, we're matching on all events associated with a failed check of rule 2.9. That's the VPC flow log control. In this instance, the event pattern will match on all events with a status of warning, failed, or not available. These are the valid values other than passed for security hub findings. Dig in and research how content-based filtering with event patterns are used to build a strategy that actually makes sense. Keep in mind, these decisions that you make at this level are going to compound in complexity and potentially cost later. Having the ability to filter and drop events provides a way to ensure the response step isn't being triggered excessively. That way, we know we're only getting the data that we actually care about. Let's look at an example of the Security Hub event. Um, because there's so much data in each event, we need to decide how to make it actually actionable. Since this control is designed to ensure VPC flow logs are on, when a VPC without flow logs is detected, a finding like this is generated. At the very bottom, we can see the specific resource that breached compliance. A message like this one will be passed to the event, tar excuse me, to the target of the event bridge rule. We can reference any of the data in that message as part of the automated response. So as far as pattern matching goes, does anybody have any questions? Going, going, okay. We'll have more time at the end, hopefully. Once the message is matched, the appropriate response will need to be considered for determining what the target service is. SNS is going to enable notifications via email whenever an event is matched, as well as pushing events to other solutions or services. SQS provides a queue for other, for other services to pull from. This is a really common channel for ingestion into like a SIM, for example. And Lambda is where we can introduce the automated remediation. In a single account, EventBridge can take the matched message as we identified in the earlier pattern and pass the data contained as variables for a Lambda function. Then this function can assume a role and remediate the issues uh, and maybe also log success or outputs. In this case, the Lambda would actually be applying a predefined VPC flow log to a VPC that was detected without it. However, if you're running more than one production workload, chances are you're going to have more than one account. Instead of managing responses for each case, um, for each use case across every account, we can use EventBridge to, in a centralized account, to aggregate the automated response. While decoupled workloads distributed between accounts is ideal, centralizing the operational wide, or excuse me, centralizing the organizational wide solutions can greatly reduce the operational management and overhead. In addition to all of the other services, an event bus in another account can also serve as a target. EventBridge enables us to pass events securely without additional need for cross-account role authentication since the event bus provides access through a, a resource policy. This is going to allow the centralization of event response into a central account. By doing this, the number of distributed components and the management overhead associated with them can be reduced. So let's stick with the VPC flow log example and centralize the response. Instead of deploying a response in the local account, a second account provides a custom event bus where a rule monitors for findings from Security Hub. I'm going to refer to it here as the operation account, operational account. 
These rules can leverage the use of multiple targets for a fanned out response by having multiple targets that process the event concurrently. Oops. Just like before, the Lambda function processes the event data, but instead of assuming a role with permissions to resolve the issue in the local account, this role is going to assume into a role in the original member account for the automated remediation steps. There's probably going to be a natural leaning towards centralizing different remediation steps into a single monolithic, excuse me, single monolithic function, but don't confuse centralization with tightly coupled architecture. Keeping these responses loosely coupled can prevent the sprawling of roles, rules, and functions. How about that? From a cross account perspective, does anybody have questions? This seems uh, like similar to like a SOAR. Is that, um, is it, would that be like an accurate thing? Yeah. yeah, so this is basically you building your own security orchestration and resp uh, automated response solution itself. Um, it It's going to be piecemeal. So instead of buying a solution that may require uh, inputs from a c bunch of different re uh, sources or s environments, this is all native to AWS and basically simplifies the remediation within AWS. Okay. But yeah, exactly. This would be what you would do. You would look at this to kind of build your native responses that you could then later add to a more matured uh, SOAR tool. All right, on to delegated administration. As more services move towards management at an organizational level, delegated administration is gaining momentum, thankfully. Uh, Security Hub, Guard Duty, and Macy all were enhanced with delegated administration in 2020. This is going to allow one account to be assigned the point of control for the service across all accounts. More importantly for this conversation though, it also reports on findings from all member accounts into the delegated admin account. And you can see that here. While it's much less dependent on EventBridge for aggregation of data, this sort of architecture can still rely on EventBridge, excuse me, still relies on EventBridge for pattern matching and acting as a broker for event responses. So when a finding is generated in one of these services, it's also aggregated on the delegated administration account for that service. With the delegated admin, what is deployed where can really vary. Here we're seeing all of these sharing a single delegated admin account, but in reality, it probably looks more like this. Because the events can continue to be passed and matched, notification, remediation, and responsibility can happen at multiple levels. Because of that, more mature organizations can provide more overarching controls without preventing decentralized remediation at lower levels. Uh, be, that the uh, be that at the delegated admin account level or at the local account level itself. There are several points where third-party tools could enhance or integrate, but they're not required. Everything here is native service. I mentioned before, uh, most services can be integrated with actions detected in CloudTrail, but like findings from our security tools, there are a bunch of actions from other services which EventBridge is designed to detect natively. We didn't go over it today, but the trigger for action doesn't have to originate from an event message. If there's an action that needs to be taken on an interval, we can also invoke these rules via cron job as a trigger. We looked at SNS, SQS, and Lambda for remediation, but stepping away from remediation, the event bridge target also um, allows it to pass a variety of events to a variety of services for a multitude of workflow uses. Um, more common for infrastructure remediation, you're gonna have SSM run command and SSM automation. If you're wanting to build out a workflow for uh, pipeline work, there's also code build, excuse me, code build projects and pipeline or code pipeline. 
as well as the other ones that we saw. If you haven't realized it already, this security automation response is nothing more than just event-driven architecture using native AWS services and sometimes a little bit of Python. All right, so let's see if I can come up with a demo and actually make this work um, live. Give me just one second to flip over. While I'm flipping over, does anybody have any questions? Hey, John, it's Andrew. How's it going? Hey, man, how's it going? Pretty good. So what have you seen would be um, like some some pitfalls or some some gaps in this process, like for, for an example, where you wouldn't want to use this? If you're getting massive and massive amounts of calls um, of events that are all triggering similarly, um, you could end up running into a point where, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the, the monolithic function. If you're trying to respond to all sorts of similar calls within a single function, that function can get kind of muddy. Um, with that being said though, and you know, playing both sides of the coin here, if you decentralize it too much and have the expectation that everything is pushed to the far end of the local accounts, you're gonna end up having governance problems. And once you start maturing your process further up the organization, you're gonna start running into uh, complexity and contradictions potentially. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so, all right, cool. So I'm gonna just demo between two separate accounts, the member account and the operations account. Uh, the operations account is gonna be in Edge. I don't wanna hear anything from anybody. And the member account is gonna start in uh, Chrome. So let's start in the member account and take a look at the, <laughs> there it is. All right, cool. Take a look at the default event bus. We, I went ahead and created a rule for high priority identity alerts. And so this rule is gonna grab the create user API call when it's coming from the IAM service. And the target, like I mentioned before, is actually gonna be the cross account security alerts event bus in our operations account. So let's switch over to the operations account. I love red errors during demos. And so here's the cross account security alerts uh, event bus that we were looking at. And we've got two separate rules, one labeled for JSON and one labeled for readable. The JSON event also triggering on create user, it's gonna send it to a JSON SQS queue and the readable also triggering on create user will send the alert to a uh, readable SQSQ. And so the reason I'm doing it this way is so we can easily look at the message that's being generated and posted to the actual SQSQ itself. What we would end up doing is replacing this SQSQ with a Lambda or something that could also do the processing of the data, even if that processing is being picked up by a third party tool. So sticking with the operations account, let's look at these two queues in SQS. So as you can see, nothing up my sleeves. There are no messages in this queue. And if we pull for messages, it's gonna come back with nothing. And the same thing for the readable queue itself, we have zero messages. And I showed you that because I'm going to flip over to our member account and we're gonna generate that create user API call. 
by creating a user. Permissions and everything don't really matter here because we only care about that specific create user API call. Now, before I can actually even get back, you'll see that the message has already been found and populated in the readable and the JSON queue. Hope everyone can see this, but this is the event message that I showed earlier. It breaks down every element about this API call. Who did it, what region it was done in, um, the responsible party and the actual user that was created itself. Now, if we wanted to take a remediation step, what we would do is we would point this message uh, or this rule to a Lambda, which would then uh, parse through the values in the event message and then take action based off of the key values that's, that are present. Switching over to the readable, it's gonna look a little bit different. This gives a easily readable format that you can push into an SNS or email and provide alerts in a readable format to people um, because we can also trigger or because we're also triggering on uh, the same event with two separate rules. This event may go to a person to take action while the other event is automatically pushed over to a SIM or other logging solution. Flipping back to the presentation, the last thing I got to talk about is how we did that, uh, that readable message. Taking the data that we had in the event, we can look at the input transform on that readable rule. By mapping the variables to the key value pairs in, each, uh, in the event message, we can craft easily readable alerts. Um, here we use the SQSQ for simplicity's sake, but these can also be used with SNS to push these alerts to like HTTP endpoints for ingestion or restful ingestion into a solution. So beyond or between uh, event pattern matching, delegated administration, and the cross account bridging of event bridges, what can I answer for you guys? Because that's all I got. I, I got a question, John, on the uh, buses itself, on your, if you go back to your master account, for instance, you've got one bus. Is there a security implement, uh, is there, are there security considerations for having just the one bus or would it be more of a, maybe a, a, a performance uh, when it comes to having like the single event bus, the default event bus, would it be, would it make sense to have multiple event buses at certain um, performance levels or, or yeah. utilization? Yeah, I get the question. Um, basically it, it, it's a, it goes back to that little statement I made about planning everything out both short-term and long-term. Um, the reason being is, well, to answer your question, if, if you're concerned about uh, API throttling or something like that, that's not going to necessarily be limited to a specific event bus because it's going to be at a service level. Uh, what you would want to do for breaking up the event buses would be for a couple of different reasons. One, logical separation, uh, just being able to have um, an understanding of what's going where, but that logical separation also translates into invocation of the actual response. So kind of like what Andrew mentioned, um, or what I was responding to Andrew's question with, if you have a response that is invoked every time an identity call is made, for example, that invocation is gonna happen a lot. And so you, you wanna kind of identify and separate out what are things that are gonna happen on a very frequent basis and not necessarily combine all of those into one. Uh, the second part of it is for permission sake. When you actually, I'm gonna, I'll show a new event bus creation. They actually provide you a couple of sample policies. The 
It allows you to specify individual accounts, entire organization, or um, without going into a lot of detail on this, accounts that created rules themselves. But let's let's stick with these two. Um, this is going to basically specify a specific account. And this is going to turn into the whole organization. But you can take it a little bit further and specify specific um, services that you would want to be publishing to individual event buses. Um, it, it's really more of an architectural consideration than it is a performance consideration. OK, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I, I didn't know what the limits were on the messages per second or um, you know, just, just kind of what, I mean, if I'm assuming, like you said, their API calls, I'm assuming there's limits to the, the message size as well. Uh, there probably is, but I'll be honest, I don't readily have that available. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. But one of the oh, things that you can do, <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. Uh, one of the other things that you can do that I didn't explicitly mention with the, um, with the input transform, in this instance, I created an easily readable transform, but what you could actually do is uh, take the JSON that you got, rename the key, the keys to whatever keys you wanted, and then build out instead of a, a string like this, excuse me, instead of a string like this, you can create a JSON object itself. So if you were wanting to pass this to um, a SIM, for example, if you didn't want to bloat your SIM with uh, all of this extraneous data that was either repeated or represented somewhere else in the API call, it happens. Uh, you can build your own JSON object and use that to actually push to whatever. Yeah, and you can have applications that you've written that are listening to event streams, right? Is that... Yeah, well, is it really just about going to specific or, or AWS services? So because I got a couple of minutes, I can Sorry. go ahead. No, no, no. This is this Somebody is Somebody else wants to ask a question. I just, I just, uh, we've started playing or looking at this and we actually have a different, um, we, we've tried to convince our architecture to move to, to, to this rather than their, their, their existing solution, but um, we've, we've gotten some push back on, hey, we've already gone down this road, but our team may utilize this, utilize this a little bit more. So I mentioned before you have all of these services and that was that, that little animated GIF that I had that you can trigger off of. But there's also another option that you have, which is service partners. There are partners that have integrated in already that will generate events that you can then build event patterns on. So for example, um, I'm at a loss because I haven't actually done one of these integrations. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. I just didn't know if there might be like a, an SDK that AWS puts out that lets you you know, listen for events with some service that you've created or is it more or less have it trigger a Lambda and then function? Like maybe, well, maybe I think the what SDK you're... isn't probably the right method to go about for this. What you're probably thinking about or what would be a good, um, alternative for that would be using something like SNS or SQS. So yeah. depending on what your the tool was that you were trying to get the data into, whatever methodology it used, you could use to either push or pull from SNS or SQS. And okay. SNS can All also right, so be used to push to- for those. Exactly. Okay. And that's also okay. the reason that the fanning out architecture is very helpful because when I go to select a target, I don't have to select a single target. I can select as many targets. Well, I shouldn't say that. I can select multiple targets, um, no. limit of five per rule. So if I wanted to send an email notification that was easily readable, I could do a transform into SNS to send the email. I wanted to capture that same API call in an SQS queue that was pulled into my SIM. And I wanted to take automated remediation action. I could do all of that from um, from this single solution, from a single rule. Gotcha. 
I will I will let somebody else take over <laughs> if anybody has any questions. No, that's cool. Great. We appreciate all the all the questions. This is a terrific conversation. Thanks, Jared. Hey John, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, does the event bridge uh, at least in a JSON format, does it have additional attributes so that object associated with the service any more than the CloudTrail event would? Uh, yes. Oh. Um, let me switch over here real quick. You don't have to, uh, to go into that if it's necessary. I can I can check it out. I just, I was just interested. Kind of look what I was using before uh, with the example from Security Hub. Security Hub actually produces findings. If you were to go to the Security Hub service and do a describe findings API call, you could pull these down. But if you were to go to CloudTrail, for example, and scroll through all of your event history, the findings themselves are not going to have the full content of the finding in the CloudTrail uh, API call. So uh, it, the API call for CloudTrail may show that a security finding was generated, maybe, um, but the content of the finding and all of the extra stuff that we get from the specific service specific uh, event type is a little bit more than what you're gonna typically find in CloudTrail. Cool, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, any other questions before we jump into, before we wrap up today, but first uh, award our gift certificates for the anniversary? We've got one more $25 Uber Eats if anybody wants to lob in one more question to uh, John or make a comment. Make it work. Yeah, I can't share my screen for the 250, but I've got it all ready to go. Uh, I'll throw a question, question out there. All righty. Uh, this is Lebert. Uh, can, what are you putting in place to stop um, your lambdas from potentially going out of control uh, if you generate uh, a lot of events? You know when I said be very deliberate with the way that you do it? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, I'll be honest, I'm probably not the best person to speak to it. I, there are ways that you can put in uh, limiters for they are. Uh, beyond that, that would be a, the first place that would tell you to start looking. But yeah. you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, and kind of going back to what Andrew said, if, if you do have a, a runaway uh, API call that you don't think about or you don't specify the specific event name and you just start generating events for every API call for the service, yeah, it's going to go out of hand really quick. Uh, this is, and this is just for everybody else that may not be in AWS as much. Putting alerts on your account to look for pricing on your Lambda is an absolute must in case you get a rogue process because uh, we ended up with a $17,000 AWS bill for a month uh, because of a process went out of control and there was no monitoring because the person had left the company and uh, it was a client of mine and it was a $17,000 AWS bill for them. And now AWS wiped it all out, but you, you need to make sure you monitor that budget. It's one headache you don't necessarily need to worry about, right? Oh, it was like a week and a half of phone calls to get the AWS to wipe it all out. Uh, yeah, just on that note, there's a very easily implemented uh, CloudWatch event, a CloudWatch alert, actually, mm -hmm. that will work for budgeting. So if whenever you guys spin up a new AWS account, just take that's a minute to, to throw that out there. That's 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 always helpful. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's actually what I'm talking about is the, okay, cool. looks the threshold increase. Right. So if you guys aren't huge in AWS, that is like the one thing you should learn from this is put that budgetary watch in place. Yeah. Keep in mind, I said the word can and could a lot in this presentation. I didn't say should for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> So cool. 
if no one's got any other questions, I appreciate y'all's time.